So we're just reading the commandment that we're doing and reading another scripture with it. And it's interesting that when you go looking for a scripture, a good family values scripture, it's a real problem. And the amusing thing about that one that you heard, would you put the Hosea one? Watch out. Thank you. Yeah. I will take you for my wife forever. I will take you for my wife in righteousness and death. It's, it's lovely. It's just a really beautiful piece. But of course it's from the book of Hosea. And actually what it is, is God referring to Israel. It's not actually about a relationship. And I won't even tell you about the fact that God tells Hosea to go and marry a prostitute to prove how uh, Israel has you know, just forsaken the covenant. Okay, uh, just putting that to one side for a moment. Uh, I want to tell you a story, and I've been itching to tell this story for a long time. Uh, you know, when a preacher's got a good story, it's just, it's very difficult to wait. It's sort of like waiting for Christmas and you want to share, you know. So, uh, when I was in theological school, I had an Old Testament tutor. His name was Ernest Nicholson, a really wonderful man. He was a Northern Ireland uh, Baptist and one of the leading <coughs> scholars in the world on, on the Torah first five books of the Bible. And his particular expertise, he was well known around the world in scholastic circles for his knowledge of an ancient language called Akkadian, which hardly anybody knows. So since then, a lot of people have been trying to learn it. And uh, uh, I was studying with him um, in, in the system, maybe just in a little tutorial group, so there were just three of us in this group meeting with him every week, and it was a wonderful privilege. Um, we were studying the Ten Commandments, and uh, to be with the person who knew Akkadian, because that's the language that it's assumed that the Ten Commandments were actually written in on those tablets of stone. All right? You've seen the movie, haven't you? You've seen the movie where the lightning comes and writes in the tablets of stone. 1956, Cecil B. DeMille, The Ten Commandments. And it's really fun to see it, you know, Charlton Heston, God, I don't know. Anyway, um, so he's, he's, yeah, so Ernest Nicholson decided when the movie came out that he ought to go and see it because after all this will be his one and only opportunity in the whole of his professional career to see a Cadian on the screen in the movie theatre. So he went to the movie really quite excited and then uh, zap, 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 the Ten Commandments come on the tablets. But guess what? Ernest noticed as Moses came down the mountain, there were actually only nine commandments on the tablets of stone. Guess which one was missing? Guess which one Hollywood had missed out? <laughs> Do not commit <laughs> adultery. <laughs> so what he did was, he wrote a letter to Cecil B. DeMille and said, Dear Mr. DeMille, I had to tell you this, but I went to watch your movie and the seventh commandment is missing from the commandments when Moses comes down from the mountain top. By return mail, we got a very grumpy letter back from Cecil B. DeMille or somebody saying, uh, Dear Dr. Nicholson, you're wrong. So, Ernest Nicholson went back to the movie theater. Sure enough, Seventh Commandment still missing from the Ten Commandments. So he wrote the great movie memorable one more letter and said, I've been and checked and it's not there. So he got a very humble pie letter back from Cecil B. DeVille saying that they'd gone back to all the, the team of scholars that they'd used as consultants on the movie and indeed the Seventh Commandment is missing. So when you go and see the movie of the Ten Commandments, you know, when you pull it up on your video, just know that you're only seeing nine. <laughs> so I guess it's not surprising that Hollywood would miss the point on the Ten Commandments. <laughs> you know, there's a whole lot that can be said about the commandment, uh, you sh do not commit adultery. Um, it's, it looks so simple. Actually, to really unpack those four words as they come to us in Scripture is an incredibly complicated business. And it's complicated because all the understandings of marriage, of relationship, and of property.
property have changed since those words were written. In ancient Israel, there was nothing like our awareness of a climate of sexual morality and immorality. Committing, committing adultery back in those days uh, was specifically referring to a man having sexual relationship with another man's wife. Uh, and the reason this was a problem was that it was theft. It's, it's a property law. And it has nothing to do with the morality of the action itself. Ancient Israel didn't have the kind of marriages or families we think of as being the norm today. Obviously, if you read the stories of those times, polygamy was very much the norm. Romantic love was not seen as an ideal. And it wasn't seen as adulterous, for example, for a married man to have a sexual relationship with an unmarried woman. Indeed, it was expected. Uh, that men would have a variety of sexual relationships. Adultery was a property crime. So, if we're going here to look for guidance on sexual ethics, um, it's, it's not going to be easy. I, I'm just telling you, right, up front. This is not something that's really going to help us. And as I said, uh, it's, it's outrageous to me that the closest I can come to a family values scripture is from the prophet Hosea. There really is no good guidance on family relationships, on marriage relationships, on committed loving relationships there in scripture. As I've said to you before, we don't know anything about Mrs. Peter, you know, and the kids. We, we don't know anything about Mrs. Paul and the kids. They're never referred to. And there's certainly no reference to the kind of relationship. Now you can, you, you can put some clues together and try and make sense of, of things. But for most of the time, what we have to do is to look at the basic teachings of Jesus, particularly about relationship and about the ways that we love. And then we have to construct our understandings of sexual morality out of that kind of framework. One of the... Uh, most disturbing things for me in the debates around gay identity and gay marriage in the life of the church has been that people use scripture for the conversation. And there's nothing there to really undergird that conversation. Again, all you can do is go back to Jesus' basic commands to love, to respect, uh, and, and to value human life. It would be really dishonest for us, you know, I keep talking about putting the Ten Commandments on the courthouse wall or on the church wall or on any wall. If you put, do not, can you keep it up there, Otto? Thank you. If you put, do not commit adultery on, on the wall, then you've got to do a biblical explanation to everybody in the room who sees it. Otherwise, they're going to misunderstand what that word is. And the problem is by the time you've explained it, the people who wanted you to put it up there in the first place won't like what you say and they'll want to take it down again. So let's just not put it up there in the first place. <laughs> Having said all of that, I, I find nothing dishonest in teasing out from this commandment where the commandment might lead us to believe in this whole area for our generation. By the way, Jesus did this, just so you remember, as we've noticed with the last few commandments we've considered, Jesus re-evaluates them in the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. Yes. But I say to you, that every man who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in his heart. Shades of Jimmy Carter. Yes. <laughs> Jesus moves away from the act of theft understanding of this commandment to identify the motivation, the feeling, the emotion that precedes the action. So it's to do with how you feel first. Now in recent generations and in most of our lifetimes there has been an enormous upheaval in the understandings of relationship 
of marriage, of sexuality, of identity, of human rights. So many things have shifted. The game has been constantly changing, and most of us in this room have found ourselves at some point in our lives really struggling whether something we were feeling or doing or experiencing was morally right, and whether it was the path that we as a person of faith wanted to follow. There are no easy, simple answers, and those who continue to assert easy, simple answers are living in a fool's paradise. By the way, I, I'm proud of the fact that the United Methodist Church and its predecessor denominations in some areas has been on the vanguard in some of these conversations. So it's good to remind ourselves of this when we get upset with where the church is now. In the 1950s, for example, the, the Methodist Church was on the forefront of developing the legislation that, that passed through Congress to reform divorce law. We said, and we still say as United Methodists, that divorce is a really, really, really bad thing. But like Winston Churchill said about democracy, when you look at all the other options, it's the best thing we've got. Divorce is the best of a bad set of options. This is the Methodism that I love. It makes uh, real it makes relationships real for us. It, 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 it brings alive moral issues and makes them human. And that's why our closed mindedness on gay lesbian identity is just so absurd. In our time, the sin of committing adultery, in my view, is less a sin of sexual behavior and more a sin of betrayed relationship. Coming as I do from a background in marriage therapy, I've met with hundreds of couples, including many gay and lesbian couples, engaging problems in their relationship. Uh, let, let me say a little bit about, about this. I, I really think that when people choose to make a commitment to another person, very rarely do they make a bad choice. Really, we make good choices about a, a lifelong partner. Uh, now, in, in Methodism, we don't, uh, unlike the Catholic, the Catholic Church sees marriage as a sacrament. Uh, when you get married, the idea is that God is deeply involved and you are transformed by the, the new relationship. I like that. I think there's something very good in that. That in making the commitment, God becomes real in your relationship with each other in a different way. Um, in pre-marriage counseling, it's always such fun meeting with young couples. It's just, well, older couples will be getting married too. Uh, yeah, Bill, where are you? Yes. Uh, <laughs> it, it's really fun because, especially young couples, they think that they've fallen in love with somebody because you know, he's cute. She turns me on. Ooh! She makes me feel so good. Now that's what sexuality is about. But actually it doesn't work like that, you know. The most important thing in the choice of a partner is, it's, it's a very unconscious process. We're drawn to people in whom we find answers to our personal our own struggles, our own inner needs are looking for somebody who can help us and give us what we need to be complete. And it's a wonderful mechanism. And one of the sad things about my experience of counseling with couples preparing to divorce is that there are many people who get to the point of estrangement from each other because they're angry because they didn't receive what they were looking for. But they've never had a way to to make it conscious and bring it to mind. We marry and we commit so that we can become what we were really designed to be. Yeah. How'd you like that? It's good. <laughs> that works. Yeah. 
When marriages get into trouble, or when adultery happens, the sense of betrayal has already happened. The betrayal has already happened. Adultery is the red flag that the relationship is already in an advanced state of failure. The action is an expression of anger. Now, I'm not going to go into all the psychology here and all the relationship stuff. If you want to know more about that, we can create another time. I believe that in a sermon, I'm not just doing analysis. What I'm doing is offering you some tools for living more effectively in the life of a relationship, both now and in the future. For me, the do not commit adultery commandment is a reminder to stay in a relationship, committed, and build on everything that it does for me. My partner is my mirror. And I may go to bed on Sunday morning and say, well, sweetheart, does my tie match my shirt? You know, very practical things. But I also ask her about my emotional responses to situations. Am I being appropriate? How does this feel to you? Would you respond in the same way to this situation? Knowing that sometimes she has better skills and insights than I do. It's a mutual process. We're always checking things out with each other. And in the process, we grow and we become something different. Now, this is, this is really true in committed relationships. That's how, that's how it works. We're, we're finding ourselves in each other all the time. And as life goes by and the years go by, we're looking for different things and finding different things. Now, for those of you who aren't in a committed relationship, is this only for people who are married or in a committed relationship? Certainly not. There are, there are many other situations where relationships of trust and mutuality are established. Adultery can happen even in those relationships because the trust has been betrayed. Adultery is about betraying a relationship. Mm. And we, as children of God, are called to build relationships. Relationships of love, relationships of mutuality, relationships of trust. Now, I know there are all sorts of, well, well Pastor, there's this situation. <laughs> well, there are all of those. But let's be clear that relationships are designed to build us up in love and in trust. We use the word love to describe this commitment of self to another in such a way that nothing can break the bond. And Chris Hedges has some wonderful language in our book, Losing Moses on the Freeway. He says, love expands our self. It gives fullness that is lacking in solitary life. It gives us balance. And sexual relations, rather than end in itself, becomes the expression of the power and mystery of love, an expression of what lies beyond articulation, an expression of the eternal, of God. Isn't that beautiful? That's what love is. The loss of love, either through abandonment or deception or death, is one that plunges us into despair so profound that its consequences can often mean spiritual and sometimes physical death. So love is such a powerful reality within us that when it goes, it, it not only undermines our self-confidence in who we are, but undermines our self-confidence in life. He then, uh, Chris Hedges leads us, of course, you would expect it by now when we're reading through the book. He makes it into something bigger and wider than purely the individual relationship. He says, uh, love is not benign. I like that. Love is not benign. It's a threat to those in power, to movements that demand self-sacrifice, to those who wage war, to the very core of the civic religion every state seeks to build out of its prevailing religious tradition. 
It is as much a threat to those who recruit suicide bombers as it is to those who direct the war in Iraq. Remember, this was written in 2005. Love defies the conventions of duty. It subverts the goals of the state. It leads us to reject false covenants. Religious leaders from Moses to Buddha to Christ to Muhammad know how dangerous love is to those who seek and hold temporal power. The forces that seek to harness the power of religion and deform it into a civic relation have no use for the fundamental core call to love. In, indeed, it's the message that they seek most actively to destroy, even as they cloak themselves in religious piety and employ religious language. Do you hear what he's saying? Do you hear what he's saying? The commandment that comes in do not or thou shalt not language really opens up for us a window. A window that we can look through into the deeper possibility of relationship. It's a clarion call to go deeper, to make our relationships stronger and better and more loving and more unconditional, more trusting. It's a call to live out the infinite possibilities created by unconditional love. It's a call to go deep and to trust that God goes with us into the depths. It's a call not to give up too soon. It's a call that recognizes that some personal pain or a lot of personal pain may be necessary to achieve a greater good. It's a call to look not only at our own personal life of relationship, our family relationships, but to look at our community and our political relationship, to do our homework and our analysis and explore all of those areas where love is being betrayed. And as love is built, not only our lives, relationship, our homes and our families, but our community and our world are transformed. I found a great quote for closing. Uh, the artist and animator Joe Murray famously said, marriage should be a duet where one sings and the other claps. <laughs> I like that, don't you? Yeah. Does that work for you? <laughs> you, know, you don't have to be married to uh, any committed relationship uh, to appreciate this. We all need somebody to clap, don't we? Amen. Right? You also, and it's really good when the person that claps is the one who invites you to sing. Amen, Mark? <laughs> and the, the, the singing and the clapping become a sort of cycle. And we, we're, we're all singing and we're all clapping. Yes? That's what these words are pointing us to. So that we can sing and we can clap with a great smile on our faces in spite of everything that the world throws.